So let's go and talk about some similarities. So um, arthropods may have some similarities to different animals that you might not expect, such as things like fish. So the name of the butterfly family, so the, um, the group that the butterflies live in is called Lepidoptera. And that word actually translates to scaly wings. So butterflies actually have scales on their wings. So they have these for a couple of reason, uh, reasons. And one is to increase their mass to keep warm. So um, they sucks in a lot of sun um, and a lot of heat from the sun to help them fly very strongly so they can get good lift off of whatever surface that they are um, sitting on at the time if they need to you know, fly to another flower or if they need to escape a predator, um, you know, whatever that may be. And it creates, these scales create all the beautiful patterns that you see on butterfly wings. So they do have some similarities to fish scales that are um, really neat. So there are lots of different types and they have different purposes. So the size and the shape of fish scales determine how fast or slow um, a fish can swim because the water washes over the scales um, in a certain way. So if you have a slow fish, um, you're not going to have very ridged scales. So your scales, your scales are going to be smooth and they might um, be raised a little bit. Um, now, if you have a very fast fish, um, that fish are going to have very ridged. So their scales are going to have grooves in them. Um, and that is going to help them in hydrodynamics. So if they want to swim really, really fast, the water will wash over them super easily. Um, so fish actually have four different types. So there's called tenoid, cycloid, ganoid, and placoid. And that placoid scale is going to be what is um, used for super fast um, swimming. But we'll get off of fish. Um, so now we are going to discuss the subphylums and um, all the different subphylums in the phylum arthropoda. So think of phylum arthropoda as like an umbrella. And underneath that umbrella are all of these subphylums and classes. So phylum arthropoda just contains all of the arthropods and then underneath you're gonna have all of these different groups. So, what I'm going to do is I'm going to name them off to you and then we are going to talk about each subphylum or class um, on down in this presentation. So within phylum arthropoda, there are multiple subphylums and classes. Um, there are five subphylums and one of them is an extinct group and one of them has two classes within one subphylum. So the extinct group is called the subphylum trilobitomorpha, or called they're called the trilobites. Um, so they are no longer on Earth. And then the remaining extant or still living groups are going to be uh, are going to be the subphylum Trilicerata. Um, and this has the class Meristomata, which contains the extinct sea scorpions and the extant or still living horseshoe crabs. Um, and the class Arachnida that contains spiders, scorpions, ticks, and mites. So I didn't know ticks and mites were a part of the Arachnid fam uh, class until um, researching about this topic. Um, so there is also the subphylum Hexapoda, which contains all of the insects, subphylum Myriapoda, which are the centipedes and the millipedes, and the subphylum Crustacea, which are the crabs, lobsters, and shrimp, which is the most delicious of the subphylums. Um, so we are gonna go through every one of these. So if at any point you have a question or a really fun comment, then you can put it in the Q&A or in the chat. And then at the end of the lesson, we will um, go through all of those questions and comments. You guys had really, really great questions and comments yesterday. Um, so I hope you keep that up throughout the week because that was really fun. Um, okay, so subphylum trilobitomorpha, the trilobites. So these guys are extinct. They are no longer on planet Earth. Um, so these are the first known arthropods. So it's a very old and extinct group. They are no longer living. Um, they're the first known arthropods on Earth. And their bodies are oval-shaped 
and is segmented into three parts. So the cephalon, which is this pink part up here, the thorax, which is this yellow part, and the pygidium, which is this little green part down here. Um, so this is an extinct group, but roly polies or pill bugs, you might know them, I've always known them as roly polies, are always compared to them because of their shape. So this bottom left picture right here is a picture of a roly poly, and they were really fun to play with when I was a kid because they don't bite you when, when you pick them up, they just get scared and they roll into this little ball and you, it's, they're so fun. So I have a poll question for you guys and that is going to be in what type of environment would you find a roly poly? So yeah, there we go. So what type of environment would you likely find a roly poly? I'll let you guys vote on that. The, oh, you guys are so smart. Okay, yes, you would find roly polies on the forest floor. So um, roly polies are really cool because they help to break down, you know, um, decaying plants. So if you're ever out looking for roly polies, if you have, uh, if you come across like a log, like a fallen over log in the woods, um, and if you happen to pick it up, which be very careful because there could be other things besides roly polies living under logs, um, they're going to be these itty bitty little gray bugs. And um, so they really like to live under these dead things. So a dead log, um, a pile of leaves, it's been there for a really long time. Um, that's where they really thrive is underneath um, all these dead things on the forest floor. So. Now we're going to talk about subphylum Chelicerata. So this subphylum contains two classes, and the first class is going to be Meristemata, which are the horseshoe crabs and the sea scorpions. So they can be described as hard, smooth, and they have greenish to dark colored exoskeletons. So um, remember that exoskeleton is that hard outer um, shell that they have since they have no real skeletons inside like me or you do. Um, so sea scorpions are actually the extinct member of this class. And this is a drawing of one right here. Um, they're kind of scary. Um, apparently these guys were really big, um, like as tall as a person, a grown adult. Um, but these guys are going to have those compound eyes that I mentioned in the beginning. Um, so these compound eyes are, or is an eye that consists of lots of different um, small little parts. So all of these small little, small little parts kind of acts as one eye, but they don't see like me and you see. Um, they mostly focus on seeing brightness and color, which is obviously different from our eyes because we can see all those things as well as shape and make out um, movement and all this other really cool stuff. So really what they need to um, see is which direction the sun is, you know, is it daytime, is it nighttime? Am I going deeper into the ocean or am I going um, more shallow towards the beach? So um, it mainly focuses on how much sun is coming through that compound eye. So they also have something called a tail sign, which is just a fancy word for a tail. So on this horseshoe crab right here, this is a spike and that is going to be the tail sign or the tail. Now they don't use this to, you know, fight or defend themselves or hunt for food or anything like that. Um, if a horseshoe crab gets flipped over, this little guy unfortunately was no longer living, but if they get flipped over, um, they can just use that tail sign to flip themselves back over. So um, it's really, really cool how they do that. But um, these are my pictures. I took these on Ship Island um, in the fall when things were normal. And um, 
they're really cool. Um, you don't see a lot of living horseshoe crabs since they are, I believe, on the endangered species list, um, or at least threatened. I know that they are in trouble um, because they have really cool blood that has really cool medical um, importance. So I'm not really sure, um, but I know that their blood is very important to the medical field. Um, I'm not sure how, so that's something that you guys could research, but um, they are at least threatened. So you won't see a lot of them. And if you do see one, it is likely um, not gonna be living. Um, but their body is also going to be segmented. So I mentioned that one common characteristic is that they're going to have segmented bodies. Um, so it's made up of three parts. The cephalothorax, which is a really big word. Don't scratch the wall. Which is a really big word for a head and a body that is fused together. So they don't have a neck essentially. Um, and then they have the abdomen, which is going to protect all of their organs and have a few, you know, arms or legs on them. And then you just have the tail. So no fancy word for the tail here, but that is subphylum chelicerata, the chelicerates. Um, oh no, we got one more, one more class. I'm sorry. Got ahead of myself. So my least favorite class is the arachnids because I am afraid of spiders. <laughs> Um, so this is class Arachnida, the spiders, scorpions, ticks, and mites, um, which obviously um, kind of scary, but all of the characteristics on the arachnids are they're going to have eight appendages. Um, they have a fused head and thorax, which is the cephalothorax, so again, no neck, um, and they have mandibles in place of claws or wings, so that is kind of a funny word for a jaw. So again, spiders are going to have spinnerets and um, they have obviously have fangs. So uh, most, spider most spiders are going to have fangs and those that are venomous are going to have the ability to turn the inside of um, their prey's body into liquids to help them eat their prey. So we are not on any spiders prey list, thankfully but um, that doesn't make me any less scared of them. But um, spiders are cool nonetheless, just because of that ability, but I'm gonna keep my distance and I hope you guys keep your distance as well. Um, so now we're gonna talk about subphylum hexapoda or the insects. So this has all of the insects inside of this little group. Um, so this means that it is the largest subphylum of all of the arthropods. So they're gonna be found nearly everywhere on earth, including in terrestrial and aquatic environments. So on land and in water. And insects can live in caves and in groundwater habitats. Um, insects are gonna be one of the most successful organisms on earth because they have spread to all these different, different environments. So everywhere you go, you're going to be near an insect um, or see insects. So if you can't see them, you know you're gonna be at least near one. Um, so that makes them super successful. Um, and then there are over a million different kinds of insects that have been described in the last 260 years. So science terms, that's not that long. People terms, that's a really long time. But in science, you know, that is um, not too far off. Um, and that makes up more than half of the known species of life on earth. So half of life on earth are going to be insects. So if that puts it into perspective how many insects there are on this planet. Um, I just hope that helps you better understand like how many there actually are. Um, so how many insects are there to be discovered? So do we still not know if there's a certain species out there or a certain type of something else that we've already found? Um, so no one really knows for sure, but a lot of scientists estimate and suggest that there are millions of insect species still to be found and discovered. So um, the great majority of these are going to be found in exotic places. So places like the tropical rainforest. Um, but since the tropical rainforest is in trouble um, with um, humans exploiting the resources, um, we may never know if there were a certain, you know, unknown insect species living in the rainforest because um, their habitat got taken away. 
But scientists do agree that six out of every 10 known life forms on earth is an insect. So six out of every 10 things that are alive is gonna be an insect, crazy. Um, but their characteristics are gonna be three pairs of walking legs. So that means six legs in total, um, three body segments, which is gonna be, you know, the um, cephalothorax, the abdomen, the tail. Um, if it has a tail, the, these um, segments are gonna be um, a little different depending on what type of insect you're talking about. Um, many of them have wings. So let's be thankful that the arachnids are not insects because we don't want spiders to have wings. Um, they are gonna be very common and very diverse. And then again, subphylum hexapoda contains all the insects. So that is why it is the largest um, subphylum that we're gonna talk about today. So now we have subphylum myriapoda, which are the centipedes and the millipedes. So this, this subphylum is really cool because both of these insects are, are super, super cool. Both of these arthropods are really cool. Um, so let's talk about millipedes first. Well, one common characteristic between both of these animals are going to be um, one single pair of antenna. So on this top picture, I believe the, um, these big orange guys right here are the antennas. And then you can't see them, or can you? Yeah, right here. These are gonna be his antenna right here. Um, so let's talk about millipedes first. The trunk segments are going to be fused into pairs, each with two pairs of legs. So this guy on the bottom down here is a millipede. And so what trunk segments means is every one of these dark bands is a segment that is separate from the next. So they um, almost work independently, so by themselves. But if you follow this dark band and you go all the way down to where the legs are, you will see two legs very close to each other, as opposed to this centipede on top where you see these really thick bands and you go down and there's only one leg on each side. So on this guy, there's two legs um, on each side and on this guy, there's only one. So if you're ever confused about whether you have a centipede or a millipede, you can think of that first. Does it have two pairs of legs on a segment or one pair of leg, uh, legs? Um, so, and actually in evolution, millipedes were the first animals to occupy the land. So that was a really cool fun fact when I was researching. Um, and then centipedes. So they obviously have lots of those segments that we talked about, but um, they are going to have one pair of one pair of legs um, per of those per those segments, and then the first pair of legs is actually modified into venomous fangs. So this is the huge difference between centipedes and millipedes is that you do not want to mess with a centipede because um, it will hurt if you get um, bitten by a um, centipede. And depending on what type of centipede it is, it's probably not going to be good. So um, to be safe, don't ever pick them up unless you are um, extremely aware of what you're picking up. Um, so centipedes are also gonna be carnivorous, whereas millipedes are gonna be similar to the roly-poly in that they just eat lots of, of that, lots of that detritus or that dead and decaying material um, on the forest floor. So in fact, mo both of these animals are gonna be most abundant on the forest floor. So um, these little guys down here at the bottom are safe to handle. I have picked one up and it felt really funny when they crawl all over your hand, but they're kind of big. So don't be afraid because they're harmless, but they're really cool. But always be aware of what you're picking up. If, because I believe it's very confusing because I'm not sure which of this is, which of these are the head. Um, and that is a tactic with the centipedes. So to confuse their prey or not their prey, their predators. So if something comes along and thinks that looks like a good snack, it's going to get confused by these bright colors, which usually means I'm dangerous in the wild. And then um, one of these two orange heads are going to have those venomous fangs. So that animal is going to be confused and not want to risk getting injured. So it's 
most of the time it will probably end up just saying it's okay I'll go find another snack and leave these guys alone just because of that so that's a really cool um adaptation that these guys have um but so these guys down here are safe these guys up here are not um so now let's talk about the most fun um phylum subphylum and the phylum arthropoda so this is going to be the crabs, the lobsters, and the shrimp. So like I said earlier, the most delicious subphylum of the arthropods. Um, so these are obviously going to be marine um, arthropods. You're going to find these in the ocean um, and probably um, close to where you live. So you'll find lots of crabs and shrimp down here. Um, these guys are obviously going to have swimmerettes um, to move in water. So if you've ever been on a boat in decently deep water and you see a blue crab on the surface and he's just kind of paddling back and forth like this, it means he's using the swimmerettes to get to a place where, you know, he can rest. Um, so they are going to have two compound eyes and sometimes they will be stalked. So we talked about those compound eyes, you know, they are mainly for seeing, you know, light, um, but sometimes they are stalked. So if you have ever watched SpongeBob and you are familiar with Mr. Krabs, his eyes sit way on top of his head, um, all the way at the top. And those are going to be stalked eyes. So if they're kind of above, um, the body and the, uh, crustaceans are going to be omnivorous. So that means that they, you know, they eat plant, uh, plants and meat. So, um, these smaller aquatic crustaceans, so the smaller, you know, things like shrimps, very small shrimp, are going to eat microscopic things, so very, very small things such as algae and plankton, so that would make them omnivorous. Um, plankton can be classified as animals because plankton is one of those umbrella terms, just kind of like arthropods, where you either have phytoplankton, which are going to be your plant-like plankton, or your um, zooplankton, which are your animal-like plankton. Um, and then larger crustaceans are going to eat things like snails, um, plants as well. And then the larvae or the eggs um, of other marine life. So most of the time, eggs of other, you know, fish or um, whatever kind of organism, those eggs are going to be just be found floating in the water until they have found a place that is... Um, good for them to hatch. So if it has a certain temperature, if it has a certain amount of salt in the water, um, that is going to cue them to hatch. But until they find that place, they're just going to be floating in the water. Um, and then the super large crustaceans like your crabs and your lobsters are going to survive on fish and other crustaceans as well. Um, so that means they're really good predators and um, they're going to stalk their prey. So I think a really cool example of one of these predators in the crustacean um, subphylum are going to be the mantis shrimp. And that is this guy right here. If you can see my mouse, I'm circling him. Oops, um, right here. So mantis shrimp are really kind of funny because um, they are known to dig holes. So they're not very big, probably biggest, probably this big, um, but they will dig burrows in the sand and then they will kind of back into those burrows and just kind of stay hidden until the right moment comes along. So a fish that is um, about their size or a little smaller comes along. They will use their specialized claws um, to knock out the fish. So mantis shrimp have claws that are shaped like clubs or like fists. You can kind of think of them like this. And they are so strong and so powerful that when they go and knock out this fish, they break the sound barrier in the water. So they are crazy fast and they are crazy strong when they go to strike their prey with those fists. Um, you can look up videos on this guy as well. They are crazy cool. Um, and they're actually so strong that they can break your finger if they... Um, ever hit your finger um, with those crazy interesting clubs or fists. Um, so that's the mantis shrimp. So they'll, they'll knock him out. They'll knock out a little fish that they might think they want to eat. Um, the fish is stunned. So it's just kind of 
floating um, on the seafloor and then they'll grab it and take it to their burrow and have a really good meal. Um, so mantis shrimp are really kind of, kind of crazy and they're really, really fun to um, learn about. So if you ever want to research mantis shrimp, I highly suggest it because they're really cool. Okay, so for our last poll question of the day, or not of the day, of the morning, of the 9 a.m. session, um, now that you know all of the arthropods, which of them is your favorite? So do you favor the arachnids, the spiders? Do you favor the crustaceans? Um, do you favor insects? So, you know, insects can be lots of different things, you know, beetles, um, butterflies. Um, if you like dragonflies, dragonflies are really cool. Um, so if you want to either type that in the chat, um, you totally can do that. Let's get to this last slide here. Okay, let me check out the chat. Oh, Giada said she tried the egg experiment. Well, let me know how that went, um, if it worked out for you. Um, so yeah, what is your guys' favorite arthropod? So Veronica and Matilda, y'all are the insects. So do you have any particular type of insect, such as, you know, butterflies or um, beetles or moths or, um, you know, whatever you can think of, really? Um, if you like crustaceans, grasshoppers. Grasshoppers are really fun. Um, Mr. Riley's favorite, Mr. Riley's favorite um, insect, there's going to be things called lubbers. Um, um, Kenzie says praying mantis. Those are really fun. One morning when I was in um, like grade school, I woke up and above my bed on my ceiling was a praying mantis. Don't know how, don't know how I got in the house, but he was right above my bed and it was kind of scary. Um, so yeah, praying mantises are really neat. Um, butterflies, moths, and dragonflies, all really cool stuff, all really harmless stuff. I like that, I like that's a good answer. Mason says, my sister and I have two lubber pets. Wow, that's so cool. Or leaf bugs and cicadas, Kinsey. Cicadas are really cool. Veronica and Matilda say the praying mantis was praying to me. <laughs> That's really interesting. All right. Y'all have really, really fun answers and I'm really loving that. All right, so I see some things in the Q&A. So let's check that out. Um, Riley, are you gonna bring your turtle today or tomorrow? Or your tortoise? Um, I'm going to do my turtle tomorrow for the, the plant lesson. There you go. So y'all got to come back tomorrow in the morning if you want to see Riley's pet tortoise. Um, he's super cool. What is the fastest arthropod? Ooh, interesting question. I don't know what the fastest one would be, but um, it kind of depends if you're talking about arthropods that live in the water or on the land. So, hmm, that's a really interesting question and I'm going to research that. And if you ask me again tomorrow or again um, at the 11 o'clock today, I will try my best to have that question answered for you. And then, you know, roly polies eat poo, right? Okay, well, they might, they're still cool. It's just one of their jobs. Um, Y'all are fun. So if you have, so I know it's a little, little bit early, but if you guys have anything um, else really fun to say, or if you want me to go over anything else, um, y'all can totally ask me those questions or make those comments, you can put it in the chat, or even if you're watching on Facebook, you can totally ask questions um, in the comments um, and we will reply back to you and answer those questions for you. Um, so, Y'all have been really fun today and it's only Wednesday and y'all have been really fun all week. So y'all keep being, y'all keep showing up and being really fun because we really appreciate um, you guys being, um, you guys participating and being really involved. Um, that makes us as educators feel really, really good 
um, and helps us know that we're doing a good job. So um, if y'all, I see something in the chat. One of, Mason says one of their lovers is on the ceiling right now. There you go. That's, that's what lovers do. They're really fun. Um, so y'all come back at the 11 a.m. To session today and I'm going to be discussing pollinators. Um, so we're going to get a little um, specific in our arthropods. So we're going to talk about pollinators, you know, how many, how many there are and what their job is. And then we have um, a really fun activity for you guys to do. So if y'all don't have any other questions or comments, um, I guess we will say bye, even though it's a little early, but that's okay. Um, just a little more, um, a little longer of a break between sessions. All right. Bye guys. Okay, so Quentin, I have researched the um, question, what is the fastest arthropod? And this is what the internet told me. So a certain species of mite, so in the arachnid family, um, was recently, this is clocked, so it was measured, um, going 322 body lengths per second. So it was, um, so I'm going to assume body length is referring to its body length. So mites are very small, but it was moving at that pace um, 322 body lengths per second. And then it says making the sesame seed size species, say that five times fast, um, the fastest land animal on earth. And then the second place is the Australian tiger beetle, which can scurry at 171 body lengths per second. So I hope that answers your question. I think that's pretty neat. Um, but yeah, uh, y'all asked, is the eggs supposed to be done today or tomorrow? Um, I can check on that. And if it is done, I will show you guys um, tomorrow. And I don't know about y'all, but it is lightning and thundering at my house. So Mason asked, why do lubbers make a smell when they are held a certain way? So if I had to guess, that would probably be um, a defense tactic. So if they are um, trying, like something is trying to eat it, they'll release that smell. And I'd have to bet that that smell also had a taste. So it would probably, you know, smell and taste really bad and make whatever animal not want to eat that lubber. So that's probably why. Just a couple more minutes and we'll get started with our um, 11 a.m. Um, hopefully this weather gets better within the next 30, 35 minutes. Um, but we can do this fun activity from our window. So it's going to be similar to the um, bird activity that we did on Monday when you went to your windows or your back porch and you watched for birds. Um, we're going to be doing something similar to that today. All right, we'll give it one more minute. It looks like pretty much everybody's here, but just in case. All right. Um, so I'm going to move my cat. Um, all right, so we're going to go ahead and um, get started. So I'm going to share my screen. All right, so this is 
our pollinators lesson. So before we ever even get started um, discussing pollinators, what they do, what they are, um, types of different pollinators, I'm going to introduce myself and Riley again, um, just in case anyone is new or anyone is new watching on Facebook. So my name is Lacey and I am a marine educator at the Marine Education Center. Um, me and Riley have been working there for almost a year. Um, I have a degree in marine biology from Southern Miss, so I've been involved in Southern Miss for a really long time, and I'm really happy to be able to do this virtual camp for you guys since we can't do an in-person camp. Um, so I'm going to let Riley introduce himself now. Hey guys, so it's me again. Um, my name is Riley. I'm one of the educators as well. Like Lacey mentioned, um, we've been working together for about a year now. And yeah, I'll be the moderator today. So I'll be um, just making sure everything goes smoothly. Cool, cool, cool. Thanks, Riley. All right, so before we get started, I'm going to ask you guys a question and I would like for y'all to put it in the chat box, put your answers in the chat box. So the question is, have you ever heard of a pollinator? You can just type yes or no. And if you have heard of a pollinator, can you name one for me? So we will be watching the chat for y'all's answers. Cool, see some yeses. All right, I need you guys to try and name some pollinators for me. Bees, butterflies. Those are definitely really good pollinators. And we're gonna talk about both of those today. Honeybee, very good. Hummingbirds, super good. Hummingbirds are crazy cool. Nice. All right, you guys definitely know what we're talking about. Um, desert bat, ooh, that's a good one. I like that answer. Okay, so. Let me adjust something on my screen. All right, so really nice job, guys. You guys definitely know what pollinators are. So we are going to get started. Um, so we're gonna talk about pollinators and pollination today, obviously. Well, pollinators are gonna be animals that fertilize plants. And when they fertilize those plants, you know, that's gonna give us, you know, all different types of food, as well as, you know, things that we enjoy looking at, like um, super pretty flowers um, and other things like that. Um, pollinators are gonna be animals that move pollen from anthers of flowers to the stigma of the same plant species. And that ensures that new plants will grow. So, um, the anthers and the stigma are two parts of the plant that contain pollen and sometimes contains nectar. And there are just different parts that you have to have for a flower to be able to pollinate or to reproduce. So this is going to be your anther right here. You can see the word anther and it's pointing to this little yellow guy right here. And then the stigma is this big thing right here in the middle. So those two things are going to work together along with your pollinators to help um, uh, reproduce new plants. So pollination is a really good thing for plants and for pollinators. So both of these things are going to benefit. Um, it results in seeds and is necessary for lots of plants to reproduce. Now pollinators benefit from this because they uh, receive nectar and or pollen uh, rewards from the flowers that they visit. So um, bees You'll see in the next slide a bee covered in pollen. So that is going to be one of their uh, food sources. So bees obviously really enjoy pollen and nectar. So it's very, very healthy for them as well as for the plant. So what exactly is a pollinator's role? Well, 80 to 95% of the plant spe of plant species require animals to be able to be pollinated. So a lot of these plants cannot do it on their own. So there are some that can but the majority of the plant species are going to need some kind of help um, from a plant or um, excuse me from a pollinator or an animal to help them to um, be able to reproduce. Now this also helps maintain the diversity of our natural um, ecosystem so it helps to keep lots of different types of um, 
plants in an ecosystem, in an environment. Um, and we need a healthy pollinator population to make sure that the next generation of plants will be produced. So it is super important to have pollinators around. Otherwise, we won't have, you know, the food that we enjoy eating, you know, fruits and vegetables that we enjoy eating at dinner or for snacks. Um, or just flowers to look at or plants to give us oxygen, period. So pollinators are equally as important as the plants that are um, on the planet. So you guys named off all these different types of pollinators. You know, I've got lots of bees, lots of butterflies. Um, I even got a hummingbird and a bat, which are really, really good examples of pollinators. So obviously you guys know that pollinators aren't just insects. So you've got lots of species of birds. So birds will help um, pollinate by, you know, eating a plant or, or excuse me eating a fruit which has seeds in it and then flying to another location and those seeds will be spread which um, spreads the um, plant species in a wider um, area and so we also said bats somebody mentioned bats in the chat and that was a super good answer um, so bats are amazing pollinators as well similar to birds and then sometimes pollen will get stuck on their fur as well um, so this is an image of a bat um, feeding off some nectar from a certain species of plant i'm not sure what that is but it looks really cool um, and then obviously you have butterflies, you even have moths. So moths will do the same thing as butterflies do. Um, they really enjoy that nectar as well. And then you have flies. So I didn't know flies could be a pollinator until researching this, but they can, and it's super cool that they can. Um, beetles, beetles can pollinate um, plants as well. And I know on the magnolia tree, which is our um, Mississippi's state tree, um, that beetles are one of the main pollinators for the magnolia tree. So that's super important to know. Um, even wasps. So sometimes wasps can be kind of dangerous and kind of scary. Um, but they are an important pollinator as well. And then you have something that's not an animal at all. You have the wind. So the wind is going to be a really good pollinator because it can pick up that pollen and blow it to all these new locations, um, pick up a seed even, and blow it to a new location where it can be, you know, planted and eventually will sprout. And then most importantly, you have the bees as one of the main um, pollinators. But pollinator populations um, and pollinators in general really need our help. So um, they are constantly changing. So pollinator populations are a little bit in decline. So their numbers are going down and that's not a good thing, especially for um, us as people, us as humans that live on this planet. So they're um, declining for a couple of reasons. One would be um, a loss in feeding and nesting places. So um, by over logging, you know, over exploiting certain types of environments um, that make way for buildings and homes, you were taking away a lot of these pollinators, um, resting places, nesting places. Um, that are super important for these um, animals to survive. Um, pollution is another reason. So air pollution is said to hurt bees in a way that it makes them hard to locate plants to pollinate. So if you know there's tons of factories in one area that release all of these super harsh chemicals um, into the air, or there's you know a very very big city, and you know you've got millions of people driving to and from work every single day, releasing you know fumes into the air that can also hurt bees. Um, so bees have a very special way of detecting certain types of plants to pollinate, um, and those chemicals in the air can definitely mess with that and make it even harder for them to um, detect all of these. Um, certain types of plant and plants and flowers that they need to pollinate and that they really just need to survive off of. Um, so not just pollution, but chemicals as well. So chemicals like pesticides harm bees. So um, there are ways you can avoid using pesticides while still, you know, keeping your gardens um, free of any pests. And we'll talk about that in just a little bit. Um, and then disease. So bees can actually get diseases from parasites. They can get a certain species of mite um, that can hurt them. 
um, make them very sick. And then they can actually get sick from bacteria and fungi as well. Um, so it's just like how we, when we get a common cold, you know, it's kind of like that, but bees are so small that if they get a bacteria or a virus like that, it's going to have way more harsh effects than it would, you know, if we got a cold. Um, and then finally, climate change. So climate change contributes to a loss in bee populations by temperature change. Um, so when the air warms up sooner, it makes flowers bloom um, sooner. So the time is off when the spring um, comes to produce pollen. These flowers produce it way too early and the bees aren't ready. So when the bees aren't ready to um, have this pollen produced, it makes them less resistant to diseases. So it makes them not as healthy um, because they're not getting the amount of food that they need. Um, so climate change and spring coming sooner or summer coming sooner um, is, negative, is negatively affecting these bees as well. So there are actually ways we can help our pollinators. So you can start by planting bee friendly flowers and herbs. So some flowers and herbs you can plant would be, you know, lavender, thyme, and sage. Those are all herbs that, you know, my mom cooks with, that I like to cook with, and that y'all's parents or adults might cook with as well. Um, and then certain flowers that are super good for our pollinators are going to be buttercups, you know, sunflowers, and zinnias. So zinnias are a type of um, flower as well. Um, and then you can provide nesting sites. So I mentioned in the last slide that their nesting sites are being um, taken away by over logging certain areas, not leaving trees while building, you know, suburbs or um, making way for bigger buildings, stuff like that. So what you can do is you can look up how to DIY a do-it-yourself bee nesting site. So one way you can do it is, you know, you just take an old can and you cut off the ends of each can so that it is hollow, you know, you can see through it. Um, and then all you really have to do is stack, you know, paper straws or rolled up um, pieces of paper room enough so that a little bumblebee or a little honeybee can go in there and that will provide them with a nesting site, a place to rest. Um, you can easily do this at home and hang it in your backyard and um, you can watch and see what types of pollinators are drawn to that nesting site. So um, if you want more ideas, there's a lots of different ways you can build a nesting site like that. It's not just, you know, paper straws in a can. Um, you can actually, I've seen where you can get like a block of wood and you can have your adult drill holes all the way through it. So you're not using, you know, all these different materials. Um, but you can have your parents look them up on, you know, places like Pinterest and just plain old Google will give you lots of really good ideas as well. Um, and then you can limit your use of pesticides. So if you guys have a vegetable garden or a flower garden um, or really just plants around your house in general that you would like, you know, to remain pretty. Um, you know, you don't want caterpillars getting on and eating all the pretty leaves or something like that. You know, there are natural ways that you can use a pesticide. So there are ways to do this that use, you know, common household items that are not toxic to, um, other, um, pollinators that are not toxic to your plants that won't, um, stunt their growth so like they will still grow and be super pretty or produce you know vegetables you know zucchinis and squash or tomatoes and stuff like that um and then finally the way you can help for pollinators is to spread the word so um every time you know a bee is brought up or if you just feel like telling your friends hey you know what i learned in um a summer camp this week um, you can tell them that bees are in need and then you can tell them, you know, everything I just told you about how you can help, um, the po pollinators population. So, um, I know it is a little bit scary outside. Um, it's clearing up at my house just a little bit, so it's getting a little better, but this activity that we can do can be done from a window. So if you have a window that is near a flower garden or vegetable garden or just tree with a flower on it in general, um, you can definitely do it from that window without, you know, getting out in the rain or getting or being worried about the storm. Um, but there are some rules to this. So before I really explain it, I'm going to go over some rules. Um, you're going to make sure that there is an adult with you. Um, so if you have to go outside or if you would prefer to go outside, make sure you get permission from your adult that lives in your house. Um, 
that it's okay to go outside, you know, in your back porch, in your backyard. Um, and then you need to know your harmful insects. So as a general rule, we're not going to touch any insects that we see, any pollinators that we see, because you don't know if you could be allergic. You don't know if this um, bug could sting you or it could bite you. Um, and we don't want you guys to get hurt while observing these pollinators. Um, I actually have a really cool example of some pollinators um, and some things that we're not going to touch. So let me move this out of the way. And then I'm going to stop sharing my screen to show you guys um, up close what this looks like. So I'm gonna turn off my background too so you can see a little bit better. And I am sitting in my floor in my living room. All right, so the angle this. So this is this is a bug board is what I call it. Let's get back just a little. Um, so these are some examples of things that you might see while you are looking for pollinators. Um, and so this are, these are gonna be some examples of things that you really, really want to avoid as well, or I would like you to avoid. So some pollinators are gonna be all of these guys right over here. So this is gonna be your Lepidoptera. So mean lepi remember Lepidoptera means that um, those are the scaling wings. So this is gonna be the um, <laughs> the group that has all these pretty butterflies and moths. Um, so these are all gonna be super good examples of pollinators right around here. And then you have all of these super cool beetles right here in the middle as well. So remember beetles can be really great pollinators too. Um, so remember beetles are gonna be main pollinators of our estate tree, the magnolia tree. Um, and even up here, you've got some wasps wasp species. Um, now these are gonna be one of the guys you really want to avoid. Um, so they will sting you, they can sting you, and I know it will hurt. And I don't know if you guys are allergic to wasps. I'm not allergic, but it's not fun to get stung. So we are not going to follow any wasps today while we are looking if you choose to go outside. Um, and then down here at the bottom, we've got dragonflies. So there's these are a few different species of dragonflies right here, which are super pretty. Um, and then let me see. So these are gonna be our arachnids. These are gonna be our spiders. Um, try to avoid these spiders. These guys are actually helping us to um, control this insect population. So remember earlier, insects make up like half of the living things on planet earth. So these guys are helping to control um, that population. So we're going to leave these guys alone. They're not bothering us. We're not gonna bother them. And um, so down here, we have some other cool stuff that really aren't gonna be pollinators um, per se, but these guys right here, these are gonna be praying mantises. So I heard someone say earlier that their favorite insect was a praying mantis. Um, and then right here, we have got a centipede and a millipede. So remember these guys are going to be um, really cool, but I don't really want you guys to mess with them because this little guy up here, this is the guy with the fangs and this big one right here are gonna be harmless. Hi Beverly, thank you. Um, and then down here we've got horse flies and fly species. And then down here in the middle, we've got um, this the big guy right here in the middle. This is a cicada um, and lots of other beetle species. So. Really, really cool stuff. So I'm gonna angle this back up so you can kind of see my face and then put my virtual background back on. So if you see any of these things, you know, mark them. We're going to mark them um, that you saw a pollinator. Let me share my screen again. All right, so again, know yourself. If you know you're allergic to something or if you're not sure, you just don't bug an animal or don't bug a certain insect. Huh, that was a pun, don't bug them. Um, but we're going to be back at about 11.45 to um, go over everything we saw. So you guys may or may not have gotten this um, sent to your parents or your adult. Um, so you can use this to track certain pollinators that you see. If you saw a bee, you know, mark it, put a little check beside it. If you saw a butterfly, mark it. Um, 
So definitely use this as a guide to help you, you know, figure out what all you saw. Or if you saw something else that you're not sure about it, you can totally, you know, get your adult to take a picture of it and send it to us. And I've got this really cool um, bug guide right here. Or you can try and describe it to me and I'll try to look up um, what type of insect it is in this little guidebook right here. Um, so as well as marking what types of pollinators you see, I want you to mark what types of um, plants that you see that could be really good resources for pollinators. So if you saw white flowers or if you saw blue flowers, if you have a garden, you know, mark that you have a garden um, or a tree that has blooms. There's a tree right outside my window right here that's got some flowers blooming on it. So I'm going to be doing this with you guys as well. Um, just mark anything you see. If you see a hummingbird and it's flying around a flower, you know, write that down. If you um, you have a bee um, beehive in your backyard, totally mark that down because that's super cool. Um, just mark down anything and everything you see. So remember rules, you know, know yourself, um, don't pick anything up, and be back here in 20 minutes at 11:45, and we will go over everything that we have seen and then we will do you know questions and answers so in the meantime i'm going to check and see what we got so far and if i don't know anything i'm going to look it up while you guys are watching as well as watch for pollinators myself so you guys go ahead and i will see you at 11:45. all right all right i feel like pretty much everybody is back um Oh, neat. Okay, so I'm going to read out loud what everybody saw. Um, okay, so Noah and Elise and friends. Um, I know y'all have several people at y'all's computer. Um, they saw everything except a moth and a butterfly. Um, Quentin said he has some colorful flowers, some flowering trees, white flowers, and that he saw a fly, a moth, a butterfly, and a bee. So that's really neat. Um, Giada said she saw a moth, a fly, some white flowers, a flowering tree, and colorful flowers, but it was raining. Yep, that can make your pollinator scavenger hunt a little bit more difficult. Um, Noah and Elise and friends also said they have very colorful flowers in their yard, so that's super important. Um, Veronica and Matilda said, hello again, we saw all the things. I'm really happy you guys saw all the things. Um, Giada said, you could have seen more if it wasn't raining. That is totally true. It's not great weather for our pollinator scavenger hunt. Um, Veronica and Matilda also said they saw a stick bug. So that's really neat. Um, they kind of scare me a little bit, but they're really cool. Um, Mason said they saw a fly pollinating their flowers and they have some very pretty flowers. So that's super cool. Um, Veronica and Matilda also saw some birds, so a blue jay and a cardinal. Haley said that she saw a moth. She's got some colorful flowers. She saw a fly, a bee. He has some white flowers, and she saw a hummingbird. That's cool. I don't get to see hummingbirds very often. Um, Mason said they also saw a June beetle and two spiders. Wow, you guys saw, you guys really did see all the things today. So that's super cool. So um, I'm really happy everybody got to see some pollinators and some things that pollinators could um, use as a resource. I was watching my flowering tree um, from my window and then it got really windy and a little bit rainy. So I didn't really get to see much um, besides just the occasional um, bee. But that is about it for me. So I'm really glad you guys saw some stuff. Um, Quentin just said he saw 19 spiders. Well, that is scary, but I hope you think that's really cool. Because <laughs> um, it is really cool. Spiders are super important. Mason said he saw an anole. Oh, anoles are cool. They're fun. Um, so if anybody who doesn't know what an anole is, it is a type of little lizard. So usually they're about this big and they can be really bright green or brown, um, but they're really cool. Quentin said it's spider season. It is spider season. Um, so now I see a couple things in the Q&A, so I am going to go check that out. Um, Noah and Elise and friends asked, how can pollution hurt pollinators? So I mentioned back here that pollution can hurt pollinators by um, affecting the way that they can find um, certain types of plants and flowers for them to help pollinate. And so I actually looked it up a little bit further while y'all were gone and um, pollution in the air 
the chemicals from the pollution in the air affect the, um, let me pause right here. They can, let me read it so I don't get it wrong. They read that um, air or I read that air pollutants interact with the scent molecules that are released by plants, which bees need to locate food. So this sends them mixed signals that interfere with the bees' ability to forage, which makes them slower and less effective at pollination. So I hope I, um, I hope that helped you a little bit more understand how pollution can hurt pollinators. Um, so Quentin asks, does it in, imbalance the ecosystem if we use bird feeders? So um, I have heard a couple of people argue about this. Um, so in my opinion, no, because, you know, birds, you know, they have a very um, natural instinct to be able to forage and stuff like that. But um, it can, you know, they might overfeed on a bird feeder so that that might um, make them gain a little bit of weight. Um, and maybe it could, you know, affect them from foraging. So it could, you know, make them not forage as often because they are relying on that bird feeder. But it is a really cool way to observe what types of birds that you have in your area. So as long as you are using it sparingly and not, you know, making it so that the birds have to rely on that bird feeder, um, you know, I think that would be totally okay. Um, so I don't think it puts the ecosystem out of balance. Um, but you always have to be very careful with any type of, you know, feeding thing. So, you know, even if you use like a hummingbird feeder, like certain things, um, that people use to feed hummingbirds with, you know, it hurts them instead of helping them. So um, always be very careful with all your bird feeders and stuff like that. Um, Quentin said he saw skink. Skinks are cool. And then Haley said she also saw a worm. That's neat. Um, it is raining or if it's raining at your house, you know, worms, they tend to come out when it's raining. Um, I'd say a lot of worms after a big storm. Um, oh, one more pop-up. Quentin said his neighbor has a hummingbird feeder. So that's really cool um, since hummingbirds, hummingbirds are one of the pollinators that are, you know, in decline, they're in trouble, they need our help. So that can help them, you know, get food, but um, you have to be very careful about what you feed them because you don't want to hurt them. So I'm sure your neighbor is doing a great job um, and it's not hurting hummingbirds though. So. Um, okay, I believe that is all for today. So um, if you guys, you know, want to take pictures of any pollinators that you saw from a safe distance, um, you can totally do that. We would love to see you guys, you know, um, doing all of these really fun activities. If you want to send in pictures of your rubber egg, if you want to send in pictures of birds that you saw or your picture of your field notebook, um, or you just enjoying, um, watching all these really fun presentations, then we would really appreciate it if you would share those with us. You know, your adults can email them right here or you can send them to us um, on Instagram or Facebook as well. And follow us here as well because, you know, we're always posting really fun videos. There's always other things going on. Um, it's not just Sea Camp. There's lots of really cool things that we're always sharing, uh, trying to share with you guys. Um, so if that is it, I think we will say bye right here. Y'all come back tomorrow morning at nine and Riley is going to talk about plants. And then at 11 a.m., I'm going to show you guys another really fun activity that we can do um, that you guys can do from home. So we'll see you in the morning.